This is Justin. And this is Haley. And you're listening to The Price of Avocado Toast. We're a married millennial couple wanting to normalize conversations about money. We want to hear about your highs and your lows. The do's and the don'ts on your path towards financial freedom. Okay, guys, I am so excited for today's podcast. We are four teachers drinking wine. Cheers. Cheers. Yay. Yay. We have white wine from the Chicago suburbs. Chicago suburbs. Did I say that right? Yeah. That's not coming out of my mouth correctly. (laughs) And red wine from California. Thank you so much for coming on to our podcast. We're really excited to chat with you guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. So we have Kate and Alex here from Chicago area and Kate and I met on Instagram and I'm basically obsessed with you. (laughs) Oh, likewise. (laughs) So I'm just really excited to have you here to tell your story where we want to pick your brains a little bit about your debt-free journey. Can you just start off telling us kind of what your debt-free journey was and how you got started with that? Oh man. Yeah. So it actually all goes back to when I was pregnant with my second second child, um, in 2017. And I was looking at our numbers because we always tracked our spending, but we never had like a budget. And I was getting really frustrated because I wanted to be a stay at home mom and it just wasn't working. So I, somehow I don't even know how I don't remember, but I came across Dave Ramsey And I went to him and I was like, hey, I need to be in charge of our budget and (laughs) we're going to do follow this Dave Ramsey guy. And he's like, "Okay, whatever (laughs) is basically (laughs) what happened with that. So I started budgeting and I had like all these sinking funds and all like basically every dollar accounted for and we would pay off debt and then I would just put that money towards more sinking funds, not really doing the snowball method. And then we kind of lost track of doing the actual paying off debt, but we always budgeted. And then after our third child was born, I was laying in bed one night and I was just like, oh my gosh, we keep getting more medical bills from her birth. And they just kept adding up. And finally I was like, you know what? I'm biting the bullet and we're going to do Financial Peace University. So in bed, I signed up for the 14-day trial. And the next morning I told him, (laughs) I was like, we are doing this Financial Peace University and we're going to actually go to a class and you're going to come with me. (laughs) And that's basically where it started. And it took us nine months and we paid off $41,000. Wow. That is rad. You guys were super fast. So that obviously, if you're a you know former Dave Ramsey listener, you know like the gazelle intensity. You guys were pretty fast. I mean, that's no joke. Yeah. So we ran into some uh, like there's some fortunate things that happened to like uh, we were gifted from our parents like a, a nice like cr- basically like Christmas bonus, which mm-hmm. which helped a lot. Or like our tax return came back pretty well pretty high. There were some nice little boosts that we received too that accelerated some of that because we weren't on track to be debt free until like the following year. May of 2022 was our original goal. Wow. And then you, he, Alex went and got a second job. Um, He started working at our church. And so that was like, we didn't even put that money into our budget. We just anything that like any check that he got just went straight to debt. Like, yeah. And I'd started thinking about picking up like a side hustle or something else in addition to my full-time job. And I I hadn't really looked around very seriously. And I was serving on the pastor parish committee, which is just like a volunteer uh, committee. And then we had an opening for um, like a video producer type role. Um, And this is when COVID had hit, everything went remote and they were wanting to do a video service and they needed to pay someone to do that. And I thought, well, I'm making a lot of videos for school and I kind of know how to do this. And I kind of like doing this. If they'll pay me to do it, might as well do it. So I volunteered for the gig and I was the only person that they interviewed because I'm the only person that was interested in it. <laughs> and I think I might be the only person in the congregation that has the skill set anyway. Um, so like it was an automatic side gig. So that was like, Hey, eight hundred dollars a month. Uh, thank you yeah. for coming in yeah. one way and 
Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that that's was pretty a sweet. Really good boost. I, I think to you guys, you know, you kind of mentioned that you had like, um, kind of some windfalls of money, right? And obviously, we did too with some of the things that we were able to do between like selling cars and something we don't really recommend, but like liquidating some Roth IRA money. Um, but I like to still kind of celebrate the fact that like former me would have spent that money other ways. I would have made a bad decision with that money or I would have like blown that tax return doing something that maybe wasn't really valuable to me. So still give you, I mean, I give you guys a ton of credit for being like, Hey, we have this influx of money. Let's throw it on debt instead of like blowing it somewhere. Yeah. And so like the stimulus, every stimulus check we got, went towards our debt and we easily could have just spent that on other things. And right. we refinanced our house from a 30 year to a 15 year in that process. So we got some escrow money back from that. So it just felt like once we started doing this, just everything started falling into place in a weird way. And yeah. it just, I don't know, it went way fast, which. Well, and that that was, I think, the strength of going through this Dave Ramsey plan because um, we, Dave would say that we did it in an ish way, right? Those Ramsey people, yeah. they're like, well, you can either do it or you're ish. And we, we were ish, ish. I think, uh, you know, we were not to the letter what Dave Ramsey says, but. That's okay. We did what worked for us. And going going through that Ramsey plan gave us a very unified goal of what we wanted to do. And, yes. and that was the big, the big key thing is because she was on board with getting debt free way before I was. And mm-hmm. it took me some time. It took basically her signing up for the class to say like, we're going to do this. And then me sitting there and seeing like talking to other people and hearing what other people were doing and watching these videos and getting information to help me get on board with it. And then once we were a united front, it, I mean, it was easy to put any extra windfall money towards that goal. Yeah. I love that. I love that you're sharing all of this. You know, it seems like for us, the same thing happened. We got started and we got some momentum and life just stacked in our favor. Every little thing was going perfect. It was kind of surreal for about two years it was perfect. We would barely have any bumps in the road. Things just worked out. And yeah. then, and then when we got debt free, <laughs> we hit several bumps and we've talked, Kate and I have talked about this a lot on Instagram <laughs> since we became debt free. It's like, what the hell? Every little thing that could go wrong has gone wrong. And I'm constantly like, why, why? Why are we being tested by the universe? Did you feel like you kind of had some stuff like that happen after you became debt free also? Uh, Yeah. So (laughs) we went on vacation, which was great. So we became debt free in April. May, we kind of gave ourselves like a bigger allowance. So all of our like extra debt money kind of went to each other and he bought a guitar and I bought some clothes, just like things that we had wanted to buy. And it was like a reward for like, we worked really hard for like this past year and we've achieved our goal. Like we're going to treat ourselves a little bit too. And And then it was nice. June, we saved up for our vacation and July we went on vacation and then August hit and we, um, our garage door broke. Um, our van needed a, a $1,100 of repair. Um, we need to have our tree trimmed, which is like $850. And we, our, es- our escrow balance was short, $1,800. I actually just paid that last week. So it's like everything. And yeah. we have, I feel like any penny that we've saved, we've had to spend to for whatever on whatever right but and it has sucked to have to pay for those (laughs) uh additional things that we were not foreseeing but we at least had an emergency fund that was able to cushion all of this so even though we have to pay these bills we had the money to do so without like sacrificing food on the table right like we were able to do it 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 sucks and it hurts because we don't want to spend the money but we were able to uh, relatively stress-free. Yeah. 
Yeah, I I feel that in my soul. (laughs) Yeah, that's a great outlook, though. I mean, that's the outlook I think we've tried to have, too. Like, does it suck having to, like, you know, take your dog to the vet when he gets bit by a rattlesnake and, like, put $2,000 in an AC unit in your car and, like, spend all this money, right? But then you think, like, how blessed and how fortunate are we that, like, we've started to get on the right track with our money so that we have money saved up and can be like, okay, what a bummer, what a, like, terrible bump in the road but it's just like a bump in the road like it's yeah. not like you know a, a huge risk to yeah putting food on the table or like keeping the lights on it's annoying but we have the money mm-hmm. and that makes us feel you know very fortunate to be able to have an emergency fund and i'm sure you've felt that same way with obviously you don't want to spend the money but if you didn't have that money it would have just put you into debt yeah and it's nice like paying it and not having to think about it again. We paid yeah. it, it's done and it's not following us like any other debt payment that we had that just followed us until we paid it off. So, well, and, yeah, and I'll add we have <laughs> uh, we've got like some friends that we we've, we've talked budgeting before um, or talked budgeting with and they aren't always in that same type of situation where you know, if they hit a big expense, like $1,100 to get a new water pump for the car, um, like that sucks, but that's going to totally derail like their month to month budget. And like, that's, that's painful. And that, and that's really stressful, you know, it adds to your credit card debt or it adds to, you know, taking away from something else that's in their life. And, um, I, I'm glad that we were able to put ourselves in this position where we don't have to sacrifice, you know, our daily life to make something like that happen. Yeah, definitely makes you feel grateful. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you guys, Kate, you say you have three kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. Obviously, you know, we've (laughs) two, we're on our way there. Can you guys just kind of talk a little bit more about like parenting young kids while trying to get debt free? Cause obviously for us, you know, we started our journey right before number one came along and then we like got debt free right before number two came along Um, But I'm wondering what it's like, like trying to do it while you have, you know, several young kids. Yeah. So actually each each of the kids, when they turn one year old, they receive their special personalized leather bound checking ledger (laughs) (laughs) from a young age we teach them right away. This is how you balance. your checkbook. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, We were actually debt free before we had kids. It was kind of. Once we had kids that we kind of, I don't know, we had kids and then we we had that double full-time income. We did. So we had the double full-time income. We did have a car that we bought brand new, which was a mistake, but. But someone had to buy a car new. Someone just, someone had to get it. I'm, I know you can't see that at home on the podcast, but I'm just <laughs> yeah. to my wife. Someone had to buy well, a Well, yeah, car. right. You get married and what do you do next? You buy a brand new car because and, that's what yeah. you do. And then you have babies. And, so, and it was exciting. It was fun. I'm I just, <laughs> glad we have that experience that we never will do that again. No, we will not. But we had, had our daughter and then we felt like we had to. <laughs> Sorry, our dog is in the background. Penny, (laughs) we had to buy, we felt like we had to buy a house. So then we bought a house, but we bought a fixer upper that had a lot of issues. And so one of our big debts was our kitchen renovation. We gutted our kitchen and yeah. We did save up a little bit for that. So we were able to tackle like a fifth of the cost of it. We did. But going back to the question, sorry. Um, I think having the little, little kids, it didn't really make a difference. Um, We just kind of lived how we would. Maybe we didn't take them to the zoo as much as we would have, or we didn't, I don't know. We did lots of going to the park and going, uh, we still put them in swim lessons. So we would go to like the family swim time that was part of the swim lessons. And we just did things that didn't cost a lot of money. And a lot of our eating out was McDonald's happy meals because it was easy and it was fast. And that's just, and it was cheaper and delicious. delicious. You know what? Let me cut in. We, we did a trip last weekend to my brother's house and on the way home, we got McDonald's and it was like, right towards the start of me being able to taste again post COVID. 
And I was like, dude, this is delicious. Right? <laughs> I was like, why is this so good right now? <laughs> I don't know if it's because I was like still hung over from the night before or what, but it was so good. There's a lot of factors well, you... that go into the deliciousness of a McDonald's Happy Meal. Yeah, or definitely. just McDonald's in general. Or just in general, yeah. yeah. I can't wait to be able to smell it again. That's, that's really <laughs> he, same he here. I can't smell anything yet. Tastes great. Oh, no. neither can Justin. Nope. Haley's like, "Hey, can you smell the baby's diaper?" I'm like, "Nope." She's like, "Cool, go change it." <laughs> hey, like Evie had a uh, real bad diapers last night and couldn't smell it whatsoever. <laughs> Caleb's Nothing. like, "This is bad. I can smell it from the hallway." <laughs> It's like a superpower. Then it's the yours to change. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, that's too funny. Okay, sorry to cut you off. So you're right. Like, I mean, getting that food is like way cheaper, especially if you're a bigger family, right? And you, it's like this is what we're gonna do. And I Justin, guess and they, they have one more kid than us. It's not like they're but a it, huge th- I think we're a big family. And we have four. Oh, well, I guess I don't know. I'm just saying, I five is bit plenty big. It is, plenty uh, but. Big. It, yeah, and it, it makes sense though that if they're younger, they're not going to know the difference, right? Like to them, it's just like we're it's time together, the park right. versus you know another trip to the zoo or something. It's not doesn't matter as much as getting debt free for later in life when it will you know maybe resonate a little bit more. And our like our reasoning and our whole reason why is for the kids. Like right. we put a down payment or a deposit or whatever for Disney World that we're going to do in a year. And this is like our big celebration um, for becoming debt free um, for our kids to be able to travel and do these vacations and pay cash for them. So, and I'll, I'll circle That's back to say that when, when the kids are younger, uh, they aren't as concerned as much as what their friends would think if they are missing out on the latest and greatest toy or gadget or you know, they, they don't have those um, types of societal pressures, like the peer pressures of you got to have this or everyone's got to have the certain toy or the certain brand of things. You know, they're they're pretty happy with like their knockoff Crocs that we got them from Walmart and they love those shoes to wear <laughs> them every day because they're green and pink. Right. <laughs> um, so when they're younger, it's it was easier to cut back on some things. We could still provide them with fun activities and experiences, but we didn't have to get uh, we didn't have to keep up with the Joneses uh, per se. I yeah. love that. We need to like cut that and put that as like the the teaser for the episode. <laughs> if I have time, I'll remember. Yeah, it's <laughs> that's just, so it, true. It's important. It's, it's so, so important. true. When kids go to school, that's when all of that starts. Mm-hmm. You know, you see your friend with the cool backpack. I mean, I used to think Jansports were for rich people because yeah. everyone had Jansports except for me. I had a cheap. I think it was from Walmart backpack and I felt like I was not as cool. And it's just little things like that. No one told me I was a loser for not having a Jansport backpack. I made that myself. Mm-hmm. But that's when it starts, when you start to be around other people and in school. And Oh, yeah. This is one that, okay. So I, I like talking to people that are also debt free about this one because I think it varies so much between... Yeah, between between families and between people. What if you guys are comfortable sharing? What long term money goals do you guys have? We actually have. I know you guys can't see on a podcast, but our why, and we actually put this in our bedroom um, next to our closet. And, That's awesome. Uh, basically, we put on here like to have financial freedom and to give of our family a life they deserve. Um, so paying, helping pay for their college to go on vacations, um, and to let them do sports and extracurricular activities that they want to do. Because I know like growing up, I danced competitively and it was so expensive. Like I did not know it then, but looking back on how much my parents spent, like it is outrageous. And I know other sports, it's, it's crazy to put your kids in sports and extracurriculars nowadays. So we just want to be able to do that and not have to think about it and just be able to do it. That's awesome. You, you can't see it at home, but Caitlin did make us sign it. She put some X's <laughs> on the paper and we had to sign he it. signed it. So oh my God. Accountable. I, I love it. Fun. You guys are know, definitely like, teachers. It was a brilliant idea and I love you for it. I just want everyone to know that you made me do that. That is an official document. It is that is official. official, yeah. Legally binding. 
That's awesome. You should laminate it. <laughs> we should laminate it. It's I'll, starting I'll to it, curl. I'll take it to school. The laminate is <laughs> up and running now. I got an email about that today. Oh, good. <laughs> so, Kate, did did your family like struggle when you were growing up, or did you just kind of recognize as you became an adult, like, whoa, dance is super expensive? We never really had money conversations growing up, but I don't think um, there was much struggle. My so I'm the youngest of four and my parents paid for most of all of our colleges. So, and he was lucky enough to have that too. So none of our debt was student debt. It was all That's awesome. debt that we did ourselves. The, um, the only loan you ever took out was for your flute. Yes, I did take out. Okay. <laughs> I did take out one student loan and that was to buy my flute. Um, to, to be fair, I, I'm teasing her, but it is a beautiful flute. It's absolutely worth. Should we tell them how much it what? was? Well, yes, yes absolutely. Yes. Should you tell okay, us I, a thousand percent? I, I have like maybe th- what, four <laughs> saxophones and a, and a few guitars, and none of it's like real high end stuff, right? Uh, but her flute is more expensive than all of the instruments that I own put together. Probably like two or three times more than that. So oh guess, guess how much you think. Okay, now I'm thinking like okay. I'm thinking like five thousand dollars. No, seventy five hundred. <laughs> what? So I'm thinking it's like seventy five hundred. Well, no, hang on. How many guitars? And are they acoustic guitars? I've I've got, I've got an acoustic and an electric, an electric bass, and then the saxes. Um, Four saxes. The, yeah, the sax the saxes I've got like probably about eight grand sunk into saxes. E- holy smokes how expensive was this flute <laughs> it was like twelve thousand dollars it's like a car. holy smokes you still have it though oh right? yeah it's not going anywhere i'm not allowed yeah. to touch it i'm a middle school man. yeah <laughs> oh okay. my gosh okay just so people know you are both music teachers right yes mm-hmm. yes okay <laughs> they're Sorry. like no she's a she was a poli sci major <laughs> <laughs> she just loves flutes it's a flute enthusiast but she studied poetry in undergrad yeah. but i did Okay, so going back and like talking about the like comparisons. So I went to a band camp. Oh my God, yes. It's just one time at band camp. Lean into it, lean into it. I went to a band camp uh, going into senior year at a, at a college. And I, there were like five flute players at this band camp. And then I didn't have my good flu because I didn't buy it until college. But there were girls there that their parents, like they had $20,000 flutes Holy and smart. they were in high school and they, one of them is like a vet now. Like she doesn't even play anymore. Well, so, and, and, and to be fair, like in, in the big picture of like instruments, <clears throat> like instruments are expensive. Just, they just are. Right. And in the world of orchestral instruments, you're talking about even more significant investments and we don't need to like branch down that conversation, but like violins and cellos get very, very pricey. Um, but your flute, happens to be like handmade by like an actual person like an actual flute artisan who like did it all and that flute was created by specific hands and that that's why the price of it is up there so high wow it's beautiful i would let it, i would never have thought that and, and flutes are unique that way like clarinets and it's like saxes are all factory made it's like yeah flutes are not whatever, for whatever flutes reason. are for whatever reason this weird category of band instrument where they're artisanal and that's fancy fancy so now when everybody's like hey our music program needs money to survive (laughs) it may not be a twelve thousand dollar flute but clearly instruments are expensive they are expensive yes yes they are wow that's so can we talk a little bit about the debt that you guys did have yeah definitely did have so you had what was it was it credit cards your car what was it we had um and okay, I'm gonna be really specific here. So we had Love it. our OB bill from the delivery. We had a hospital bill. We had an epidural bill. We had a like home improvement st- store card. We had our couch that we purchased. Very so it was diplomatic. I guess another. We did that too. Store card. Um, our minivan, just like a Visa card. We had our kitchen loan and we had um, his car, Ma- a Mazda. So legit other than student loan debt. Everything basically. other. Mm-hmm. Very normal. Yeah. 
and uh, very normal. Someone listening is like, mm hmm, mm hmm, totally did my kitchen, got a car. Oh, I've got the couch too. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, and we've, we, we've always felt extremely fortunate because both of our parents were able to support us and put us through college. And, right. you know, talking with friends of ours who have student loan debt. Uh, or that both spouses have student loan debt and how most of their money goes towards those loans. It's like, oh my gosh, how can you do anything else? Mm-hmm. Like That's it's how they just, do. just incredible that uh, how outrageous it can be. So we're, mm-hmm. we're, yeah. we find ourselves extremely lucky and extremely blessed that our parents were able to do that for us. So thank you, mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> seriously. That's awesome. Well, I'm sure you guys too, you know, that's one of your things that you're like, we want to be able to provide that for our kids. You know, we're two master's level teachers that are like, what did we do? Yeah. You know, like, why did we do this? Versus my twin brother, who's a teacher as well, went to, you know, get his BA and did some undergrad classes and then did this like really cool intern teaching program. And he, I mean, he's a killer teacher. He's incredible at it, but he did it for $8,000 and like paid out of pocket for it. Like, you know, way, way cheaper. So, well, he I mean, kind of, of ours too. He kind of did that for his master's. So he has his master's and he got it for free. He was actually paid to get his master's. Oh. Whoa. Okay, explain that. Uh, it was through a through a large Illinois institution, I'll say. <laughs> I don't know how you feel about like if we use like actual names on or anything. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So I I got my master's through the University of Illinois, and uh, they have a, a big prominent summer camp that if you go down, you know, like you, you apply for the school, like it's a summer's program, it's three summers, um, and you take like four weeks equals a semester of a class. So it's very accelerated and very dense, and it's a lot of reading um, and a lot of writing. But you um, had to work for the camp. But, so you can go do the program, but if you also work as a counselor for the summer camp or for the summer music camp, they will uh, foot the bill for housing and food for the weeks you work the camp. And they'll also give you the tuition waiver. Um, and in fact, I actually got a stipend for being a counselor as well. What? Um, wow. Basically okay. you go to school, like and the kids, like all go through the camp independently. So they go to classes and rehearsals and do music stuff through the day. And I'm also going to classes and doing stuff through the day. We hit the evening activity that we're all together and I'm responsible for children. And then they all go to bed. We do our homework. Maybe we sleep. And then we do it again the next day. And um, the hard part about yeah. wh- about that was he w- was living three hours away from us then. So yeah. the first it was three summers. So the first summer I was pregnant. The second summer I, we had our daughter. So I was like doing it by myself. And then the third summer I we had our daughter and then I was pregnant again. So I'm glad he did it then because like having all three kids would be harder trying to do it but it was it was hard but the benefits outweighed how hard it was right so that is we could not have afforded to pay for that master's program right because what i think we figured out it was like eighteen thousand dollars a summer and i couldn't have we couldn't have afforded to do that and and family wise you know like being pregnant having the baby and then being pregnant again with uh, a toddler. I missed a lot of years with our oldest in, in those early, you know, I missed a couple months with Ella. Um, but in the end, you know, the, the benefit of having my master's and being able to do it for free uh, was a huge, huge benefit. Yeah. I'll say, can I ask you guys philosophically, how do you guys feel about student loan forgiveness? Oh man. Um, I, I don't think it'll happen, but with how much student loan debt there is and how it's the interest, that's the issue. It's the interest that's killer for everyone. It's like, even my little loan that I had, I remember looking at it and like looking at how much interest was accumulating on it. But so I can't imagine like these hundreds of thousands of dollars that people have and how much well it causes you to have to pay that balance for like years more than what you should have right yeah Uh, yeah so i think i think something should happen 
I don't know. I, I just don't think that it will, which is so sad. I, I think, when yeah. It, yeah. I, th- I think short term, I think it will, it will give a boost because people that didn't have that money like month to month will be able to use that money towards other things that would help the economy and help be able to like purchase other goods or like to help them do other things or maybe to actually pay their rent. Um, you know, it, de- it all depends on your situation, but extra money in your pocket will help you. Right. It doesn't matter how yeah. well off you are, but I also think that it is probably a very short term solution. Like it will help in the short term, but the longevity of that is like, unless you fix the system that is broken of like how mm-hmm. we give out student loan debt or how prices of institutions and textbooks and everything have gone up exponentially, okay. like that's a problem that's out of control and that needs to be addressed too. So yeah, the, the, the forgiveness could be good. It's a Band-Aid. Yeah. Yep, that's how we feel too. I think it's definitely a Band-Aid on a much bigger issue. Yeah. And I don't know that it will happen. Of course, we're hopeful that it does, but realistically, I don't know. It's just yeah. Next year, we'll see. It's sad, like, thinking for when our kids go to college, how much it'll mm-hmm. be. And if we'd even be able to cover all that for them, because, I mean, we have three kids. That's a lot of money to send towards college when college will be like $50,000 a semester or whatever insane amount of money. Like, right. I don't know. It's yeah. That's a good point though, about the interest. Like I actually haven't thought of that in the whole student loan forgiveness idea. I've thought of it very much so of like a, this or that, like either it's done or not, but that's a good point. Like maybe if they just stripped, you can't earn interest on this. Or even if it's like, a fixed interest like amount, not a rate like percentage, but just like, yeah, it's this plus an extra five grand or something. Like, I don't know, something to where that interest isn't compounding constantly because that truly is what what gets people. Right. They get in those income-based repayments and they just cannot make that payment long-term. Yeah. Well, I guess they are making that payment long-term, but like you said, Alex, you know, 10, 20 years post payoff like they're still trying to pay it off because the interest has gotten them so hard well and you shouldn't have to work the majority of your career to pay off the schooling that got you the career like that's i don't think that's the american dream that's not what it should be all about that's a good point it's a really good point so if you guys were to go back in time like five years ago how old is your oldest she'll be six in december okay we'll go seven years back (laughs) Before you had the baby, mm-hmm. if you were to go back seven years and give yourself advice, what would that be to younger Alex and Kate? Oh, man. I think it'd have to be save more and start your retirement fund. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest one because that's like seven additional years in a in a Roth IRA or some other kind of retirement account. Oh, man, like seven years is a lot. I think mine is just contentment. Seven years ago, I found myself still comparing us to other couples our age. And it's, yeah, the keeping up with the Joneses. I was not content with the stuff that we had. And I felt like the purchase of goods is what would help that, I guess. Not that I wasn't content with our relationship because I was, but it was like, well, seeing, you know? <laughs> 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 seeing our friends go off and buying houses or buying new cars or buying this beautiful new purse. And it's just that level of contentment that we have now that I wish we had then. Well, and to say a few things about that, I mean, watching our friends spend money when we were being, a little, probably, I think, more conservative than what some of them were. I mean, they were probably still in some financial troubles too, but like mm-hmm. the grass yeah. always looks greener on the other side. Right? Like, I don't mm-hmm. know what their ledger looks like. They could be way deep into the red, but they're still going to go buy a new car because you can finance that. Like that's, we don't know what the situations are, but it doesn't change the fact that, Ooh, like that's a shiny new thing that we don't have. Right. Like that's, that's disappointing in some ways. Um, referring back to the Ramsey plan, they always say that in a, in a, in a marriage, you've got a spender and you've got a saver. I'm the saver. <laughs> um, As Kate slowly cringes backwards. So, yes, when we had that dual income, one of us was more likely to spend money than the other one. And 
trying to say this as diplomatically as <laughs> It's possible. me. Yeah, as you say, you're really, uh, she, really staying safe as a husband there. And you didn't ever put us in financial ruin or anything. like. And I, sh- I, I don't want people to think like she just like had a wallet of credit cards that she was using all the time. But um, she like, you know, Target was a good place to go and uh, drop some cash, you know? Yeah. I still like to spend money. <laughs> Let's be honest. So, and yeah, and that's me too. <laughs> But you're spending, you, you become so much more proactive with how you limit your spending and how you fight against those urges. And um, and I'm still a saver. <laughs> <laughs> it's working out. <laughs> so the big question is, do you guys still follow Dave Ramsey? Dave who? <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> no. <laughs> so we, we still follow a lot of the philosophies. I mean, I, going through that financial peace class was... Uh, I think that was habitually changing for us because we, say we don't spend like we used to, and we're much more thoughtful about how we approach our money and our budgeting. Um, we certainly don't follow the plan to a T. Uh, not that we ever did, but we probably follow it less now as we're trying to do some other different things with our money too. Yeah. Like we, throughout our whole journey, we still used a credit card, but we just paid the st- the balance on it. And um, so we, we have continued doing that. We only have one credit card. So it's not like we have 5 million credit cards that we're trying to keep track of. We, we only have one. And um, yeah, what that's, else? We've downsized we, that oh, we never stopped um, putting money into our retirement. So yes, we're Brilliant. teachers. So we have to put money into our pension anyways. Like we don't have a choice, but we also have 403 B's that we started. Ooh. Well, and, and the, that may be an Illinois specific thing that we are having to contribute to a retirement fund. I don't know if you oh. have. No, we, we have to out in California too, actually. Okay. Yeah. So I think mine is 10% out of my paycheck has to go to STRS. Or is it sixteen percent? It's one of those two. I think. Yeah, I think I'm ten percent. Wait, my freaking my my check stubs right here. So, and I think it says on here exactly what goes to stirs. So let's see. Well, look at those numbers. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> wow, California. Look at that pay. I don't know. Okay, so what? Let's see. Stirs monthly out of my paycheck is two hundred sixty dollars. My paycheck is like it's about two, two grand. About so it's about ten percent. Yeah. Well, that's not bad. About Aren't 10% goes into the pension fund. It's probably around there, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's mandated here for us. So like you, you, you got to contribute. Option. And the thing with our teacher pension is it's like, I'm pretty sure not doing well. So there's always been talks of no, like- No, that's, no, that's, a, that's a political misconception. Okay, fine. We won't even talk I've, about it. <laughs> well, the, 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 Illinois is known for not- being great with its state budget <laughs> and the, i think that in general i don't, I don't want to turn this into a politics podcast i think that in general there's a lot of people um that would like to get their hands on that that teacher retirement money because it's a big pot of money like it's a very large pot yeah. of money uh, but it's going to people that contributed to it but it is not a state-run program right it's mm. So I, I think that that's a thing. There's a misconception that it will ever disappear. I don't think that it will. Um, I think that it will be there for a good long while, and I hope that it's there. But yeah, the there's been talks out, of it like just disappearing, basically. But there's always and, been wow. rumors that circulate around that. I've I've got some coworkers that have retired in the past, you know, five years, and and talking to them, they're like, call your TRS rep and just ask them about it. They're like they're very, very, very careful about protecting your money and making sure that it's going to be there for you. Cool. You guys are wise for having 403Bs on top of that. Yeah, we don't put much into it. Like his, I think, has... How much do you put a paycheck? Oh, uh, like half of it? No. <laughs> no it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, right. It's dumping money into the 403Bs. <laughs> it's like 50 bucks a paycheck. No, I think like it's 100, 100 bucks a paycheck. A paycheck. Yeah. But it adds But everything helps, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, in the long run, like that's great. So that's another thing that we, uh, the the DR community, would not uh, uh, like that we approve of. Approve yeah. of, yeah. But I think the most important thing that people need to realize, and this came from we realized this once we saw the light, but it's okay to do whatever you want to do as long as you get to your end goal. And it doesn't matter how you do it. I mean, we did so many weird off-the-wall things that got us out of debt. 
But that's okay because yeah. we're here today and we're still not totally out of debt. Dave Ramsey would have said to pay off all of our student loans right when we sold our house, but we didn't. We're just sitting on the money. Yeah. So there's a lot of things and people have to do it however works for them. And so I'm glad that you guys did whatever you needed to do to get there. Yeah. And much like you said, Alex, like as long as you're a unified front, right? right. As long as you're a team in those decisions, like you're, you're going to be better off in the long haul versus like constantly being unsure of one another, the choice that you're making. Right. There were so, times when I would c- go to Alex and I would like have a new idea, like Alex, let's do this. Let's do this. And he's like, we need to focus on one thing at a time to achieve the goal, <laughs> which in the long run helps, but my mind goes like a million miles a minute and it feels right. like it takes forever to achieve the goal. So I like am already past that thinking about the next thing, but. Well, and, and you had jumped in way deeper than I ever have. Like she started listening to different financial podcasts and, you know, following different people on Instagram, cough, cough, why we're here. Right? <laughs> and, <laughs> but, but she is really it just dove into all of those different types of communities on social media and the, what's available on the internet. And uh, it's just, you, you just become part of that. But when you're part of that, you're hearing all these ideas of all these different people that are doing it in their own way. It's like, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. And I think we experience that as teachers too, right? There's so many different yes. ways to, to do your teaching and there's not really one right way to do it. There's some ways that you probably should do and some ways that are more smiled upon, but it, as long as you're like doing it effectively, um, I think that's what's important, but it's really easy to get lost in like what everyone else is doing and trying to do all of those things. Like, no, no, you can't do everything. Pick okay? what works mm-hmm. and focus on that and be good at that one or two things. I think you've told us to do that like five times because I'll I say the sixth time if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to put that, though, because at least for me during pandemic teaching, right, like you could go to every teacher and be like, what are you using? And they're like, oh, I found this tech thing and this tech thing and this tech thing. Mm-hmm. And then you go to somebody else and it's three totally different things. Mm-hmm. And you can find all these really cool tech tools. But you're like, I got to do what works for not only me as a teacher this year, but the students that I have in my class. Um, other, you know, Otherwise, you can just steal everybody's ideas or I don't want to say steal ideas, you know, but try something that everybody else is doing and it may not work. And then, like you said, you never really get great at like the one thing that you need to be working on. Well, and a great example would be Bitmoji classrooms. Like so many people jumped on the idea of Bitmoji classrooms and I'm not knocking it. I'm not saying that it was a bad idea, but it seems like every teacher on the planet wanted to do a Bitmoji classroom because this is the way that we do remote learning. And well, not necessarily like I was never into that partially well mostly mostly because i didn't want to take the time to make one and i just didn't think it would be useful for me teaching band um so i didn't make one but i had co-workers that did and they loved it and the kids liked it and you know if and you made that tool and survived. implemented it well then great but that was an idea that everybody talked about and everybody yeah. wanted to do and it wasn't always effective for everyone yeah i did that and then like a month in i was like i'm over this i'm over updating this i'm not doing it anymore and a kid was like, Mr. Brownwoods, have you updated it? And I had to have like, a hard conversation of like, sorry, buddy, like we're not, the Bitmoji classroom's going to go away because it's not effective for us. Like, <laughs> yeah, you spend all this time. You're the only person invested in this. Like, I love you, Ethan, but <laughs> you're more invested than me, son. I can't have that. <laughs> you spend all this time creating something or if you look at it like budgeting, you spend all this time being super specific and then what's, what's the outcome? Like, is it really worth all of that effort for the Bitmoji classroom for nothing to happen yeah. just to keep yourself entertained? And if that's what you need to keep yourself going on your debt-free journey to have something spiced up, then keep doing it. But if you don't need it and it's producing more work than it's yeah, worth. Yeah, then, then it's not worth it. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, oh, I, I love your Bitmoji I, idea. <laughs> yeah, I think at a philosophical level, it's just work smarter, not harder. Like I don't yeah. want to dump a ton, a ton of time into something that's not going to give me much yield. I, I'm getting too old for that as much as I think to say <laughs> it, but I want to be very effective with my time. Well, same with like making a budget. It's like, yeah, you can make a budget in the beginning of the month, but it's like, what's the end of the month? Does, does it match up? Like, did you stick or with it you... or did you rework the budget to look <laughs> a different way because you heard about this good idea on a, another site? Right. <laughs> yeah. I, 
That's an example. She's never done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the listeners are like, okay, tell us if he's like nudging or anything at that point. <laughs> That's too funny. So I know that since you guys have become debt free, Kate, you actually started grad school that you guys are paying for. And you finally were able to have money set aside to get Invisalign. And both of the those things were big things to save up for big purchases. Can you tell me a little bit about how your mindset has shifted between like, saving and now you're you're in it and you're able to pay cash to do these things? I will say it's a lot harder. I, for some reason I had, it's a lot, or I should backtrack. It's a lot harder to save. I, when we were paying off debt, as soon as that paycheck came in, I would like not even look at it. I would just send the, the amount of money to debt. But now it's like, I put that money in savings and then it like, we need it for something and it comes out. So it's just harder to save. But the mindset thing, I don't think our mind, I try and keep the mindset the same. So I try and like, we have a goal to have $15,000 in our emergency fund by the end of the year. So I'm thinking of that like mindset as a debt. Like we want to have this paid off by December because for me, I work better. I don't know, for some reason, my brain, it just works better when I think of it as like a debt versus saving. I don't know why. I cannot explain it. But. Yeah, we we became debt free. And then we had that that month of May where we like we bought nice things for ourselves as our reward. And we're like, okay, we'll get back on track next month. And for the most part, we did. But it was a whole lot easier since we're like, we're debt free to like maybe splurge a little bit and go out to eat one more time that we didn't need to, you know, and it was little expenditures like that. Um, mm-hmm. But it, we've had to come up with some different styles of goals and thinking about, yeah, like we want to hit the certain amount in our savings account. Well, let's think of what we owe to get to that amount. Like if we have 10,000 in it, we want to get to 15. Okay. Well, we owe $5,000. Think about it. Think about it as a debt and something in in our mindset seems to be more uh, effective thinking about it that way. I love that. That is super cool. Do you guys have any other like tricks or anything else that's kind of helped you stay on track like beyond that because that's a great one i love that um i uh, oh Am- amazon if if either one of us wants to order something on amazon then we have to confirm it with the other person because it's very easy to say oh i really want that new t-shirt or i really want <laughs> you don't say yeah <laughs> and then wow. we'll tomorrow oh great right <laughs> It's very easy to just click the or click it and get it and, and and be done. But those things add up so quickly. Like, okay, five dollars here, ten dollars here, fifteen here, whatever. Who cares? We we can afford it. But then when you add it all up at the end of the month, you're like, well, shit. Uh, <laughs> we spent three hundred dollars on Amazon. And it's but- it yeah. by 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 talking and like telling each other of the purchases it's mainly me asking or telling him like hey i'm gonna purchase this is this okay it's it's like <laughs> it's like confirming the nuclear codes before launch right it's like okay yeah. my keys in the ignition do i have your confirmation <laughs> to do this <laughs> and then we do it and then it's fine but we have, we were accountability is really what it's getting yeah yeah A- accountability is huge and it's not about some someone listening is like they're asking their husbands for permission to use Amazon. It's not that. It's more of the accountability. And I think if we did something like that, that would probably be a really good idea. We should probably do that. But <laughs> because if you have someone to talk through your thought process of like these are the things that I want to buy, these are the reasons why I buy them, why I want to buy them, and then someone can be like, "Dude, we literally don't need that." And then you can think uh, think through it, or or. And that's exactly like, oh, how really the conversation that. goes. That's my job. Yeah, he's like, yeah. "Do we really need that right now?" And most of the time, I'm like, "No." So then it goes in the save for later. <laughs> yeah. Category. Oh my lord! That I, I don't know how much memory Amazon has, but our save for later is. Um, yeah. It looks like a jewel receipt. A yeah, wall we were. Receipt, it's huge. We were having our, uh, I think it was maybe August budget meeting. It must have been August. And Haley goes, 
hey, we need to budget um, some extra for the girls this month because I want to get a couple things. And I was like, well, don't you think that would just go like under the <laughs> Calliope and Kennedy fund? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I guess I could buy it out of that money. And I was like, we should probably just do that then. Like we have a fund literally for the girls. We don't need to add more. If you're saying you want to buy something, that's the fund it comes from. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I usually at the beginning of the month, I, I have a cart and I showed him this today. <laughs> I have a cart of things and I'm like oh this is going to be my beginning of the month Amazon purchase and I just let things sit till the beginning of the month and then we'll put it in the budget as beginning of the month Amazon <laughs> instead of miscellaneous or stuff for the girls <laughs> anyway yeah I had to be like I no that's for that. the kids I put it in the kids that. fund or just like right, an Amazon Amazon budget item yeah just, oh my god I if mm -mm, <laughs> I'm scared if we had that it would be way too high yeah, just would. because at least at least now we have it divided into several different categories, That's true. not just Amazon. Yeah. I I really don't want to know how much we spent on Amazon in one month. What do you think it is? Too um, much? you know, I, but I will say a lot of it is budgeted for other things. It's definitely convenience, right? Of like getting toiletries yeah. or you know like sponges. Um, you know the, <laughs> some of the other stuff that you've had to get on Amazon. Like you got the 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 sea thin things for. Oh, breastfeeding, breastfeeding or whatever yeah. like yeah like th those things are convenience factors of the fact that it comes straight to the house versus getting it at like cvs or something yeah it's Sorry just a little different i'm supporting jeff bezos guys but but the convenience factor is Jeffrey Jeffrey Bezos. Bezos. oh my god i love that i love that that's great i like to think that you're supporting the you know low wage workers who are you know just trying their best that, that's Amazon? what I like to think. Yeah. All right. Then that's, that's a good. You know, just think like this human's got a job, and I'm supporting them instead of Jeff Bezos. Perfect. He can know. go to the moon. Yeah. Or you're supporting Mackenzie Scott, his ex-wife, who's donating some money. Hopefully, I don't know. Perfect. Oh. Okay, Kate, you are a listener to the podcast, so I'm sure you know about our famous last question. We want to ask. Tell me about the last question. <laughs> it's well, it's, buckle up, buddy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you guys could put a stop sign on anybody's financial journey to stop them from making a bad decision or making a mistake, where would you put a stop sign? And I'm going to uh, split this team up. You each have to pick your own. You can't be united on this one. Oh. oh. Let's see. Maybe it's the same one. Whoa, that'd be cool. If I they're like, oh, this is definitely it. Or, or is this question like, is this a, that you would notice? It's however you interpret it. Oh. Okay. And you have to go first. Oh, he has to go first? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> She's trying to give you extra time. That's all it is. I already have <laughs> Oh, then you should go first. No. No, you go first. Um, I, th I think that if I have two subcategories, the first is like for eating out or for like social type events, I think stop spending so much money on alcohol, especially on uh, for like younger people who like going to the bars, like the bar scene is a thing, right? And that's not for everybody, but alcohol at a bar or a restaurant is really expensive and can probably be more than half your meal if you're not careful. Um, so I'd say stop buying booze and just get a Coke and, and call it a day. And I'm Or someone, limit it to one. And I'm someone who likes drinking beer. I, I, I do like the spirits, but uh, I sound like an old man saying it that way. <laughs> Quit buying booze, like kids. <laughs> um, and then the... It, from a larger, more feelable budget thing, I think don't buy a new car. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, they, oh that was great. That was, wow, oh, we oh, are a united God. married <laughs> front. <laughs> Mine, what I was going to say is that young couple, you do not need that brand new off the lot car. It is okay to purchase a car that is a couple years old because a car is a car. That is, that's what mine was. Well, there's a ton of reasons why, like, it depreciates immediately after you purchase it. You'll never get that much investment back on it. There's, and you're, it's going to take you a lot longer to pay it off. It, there's a whole lot of reasons that go into it. Should I come up with another one? No, I think that's great. Like I said, I, I like that you guys are united front. Like, clearly, y'all are on the same track with your money. Oh, like, sorry, I hit you, by the way. Married couple oh, goals. Yeah. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> that's super. There's, there's some young millennial out there. Who's like, I just need to find my Alex or I just need to find my Kate. <laughs> like they just need to find the same human being that's on the same wavelength Aww. and doesn't want to buy a new car. 
and is okay buying a twelve thousand dollar flute. <laughs> 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 that's awesome i just i mean i i won't i won't be able to get over that we should you know what we ought to do kate obviously again follows the instagram we ought to do a uh like a question box or whatever you do of like you know guess the cost for this flute <laughs> take a and picture of see. it and send yeah. it to me yeah seriously okay. take a picture of the flute okay. in question i'll post it before the episode drops yeah <laughs> oh my if gosh someone, if someone guesses it i'll send them like a little Coffee oh yeah that. there's gonna be some flautist who's like i know this <laughs> or people will google it so i can't take a picture too close because we don't want yes. any googling right. okay yeah okay this is true okay. it is a yeah. gold-plated <laughs> flute so it will look fancy well they won't know why do i have to whisper but it's beautiful you don't have to tell people <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter if it's gold. Cool. It's so no, I'm all right you guys why are you in paris <laughs> You this guys was are awesome. so much fun. Thank you so much for coming on to our podcast and sharing your story. And, you know, like I said before we started recording, um, I haven't been invited yet to come over to your house, but someday I'm going to come to your house. And when anyone says don't talk to strangers on the internet, that's a bunch <laughs> of bullshit. Strangers are cool. Go hang out in their basement. I'm coming to yours. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> that's right. awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, thanks. Thank you Bye. Us. Thanks for listening to The Price of Avocado Toast. If you vibed with this episode, share it with a friend that you're comfortable having money talks with. And if you don't mind, we'd love if you could rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're in need of my support as a financial coach, message me on Instagram. I'd love to help in any way that I can. Until next time.